A lot of you guys asked for behind the scenes, how my tastings work, my thought process and selection of the wines that I'm picking. To be frank, it's usually pretty haphazard. Based on my mood, what I have available, it's always a rotating list of what happens to be available, what I'm particularly excited about. Saturday, it's the 21st of January. Right now, I am really excited about Quebec. So there's gonna be some wine from Quebec in the flight today. My first tasting of the day, one of my longtime members, he's actually a concierge member and he is from Halifax, and a friend of his wanted to surprise him with a tasting. So he doesn't know he's coming here. We've never met before. So I wanna open some really, really nice wines for him. This is actually what we're gonna be closing off with. Um, this is a Gattinara. It's kind of like a poor man's Barolo. A little bit more modern in style. Not so like American with a lot of the styles that you see emerging from Barolo now to sort of appease a more new world Western palette. This was a specific producer that I sought out. Someone asked me about decanting. They wanted to know if I had any recommendations for any specific vessels that would be best suited for decanting wine. I'm literally using a French press. All you need is an open jug. I do have a decanter, but it does not make a difference. Essentially, you're um, aerating the wine, so you're just opening it up to oxygen to sort of soften a lot of those tannins, and you know, when you're drinking a variety like Nebbiolo, you really want that process to happen. Additionally, if this were to be a little bit of an older wine, this is a 17, so not too, too old. You want to use a decanter to separate out those tannins or any sediment, um, just so that you're not literally drinking chunks. And I'm doing this ahead of time, like I think we're about an hour and a half out of the tasting. 30 minutes is kind of the sweet spot to really help a wine to open up. Using a decanter is great, and it's gonna really help, and help open up your wine, but the true decanter is your wine glass. You can achieve a lot of aeration and oxidation in that fashion. I really wanna open bottles that I wouldn't normally open for the average person. I do get a lot of Americans who come and taste with me, and it's amazing to expose them to Canadian wines. This might be a little bit of a controversial opinion, but I don't necessarily always want to open my best wines for these people because they just don't have an appreciation and it's kind of going to fall on deaf ears. This is a now sold out wine that I have spoken about endlessly and I was really, really happy to find one singular bottle left of it in my collection. This is La Crescent from Whispering Horse. You guys have heard me talk about this wine ad nauseum. It is a hybrid variety from the Fraser Valley, just outside of Vancouver, farmed by the lovely couple, Melissa Giesbrecht and Laurent Fadani. They are just killing it. This variety is so hyper aromatic, it's so floral, it's juicy, it's fresh, it's bright, it's, it's acidic. It's everything that you want in a white wine and it is such a crowd pleaser. I have never found anybody that I've poured this for that did not immediately fall in love. So I'm really, really excited to share this with my guests today and I hope that they love it as much as I do. As far as the rest of the flight, I always try to offer a nice cross-section of the main producing provinces of wine. And I say that because there is wine production happening in New Brunswick. There are fruit wines that are being produced in Alberta. Do I necessarily want to pour those? No, I want to show what I think is at the forefront of quality. I try to do, you know, a kind of east meets west sort of vibe for most of my tastings. Again, it depends on what I have available. If you've been following me for any period of time, you know that I'm all about finding those gems in the rough. Stuff that's not available, stuff that doesn't exist, according to the VQA or the LCBO. I have been pouring a lot of this lately. This is Rico Bambino. They are now defunct. Um, there's a lot of you who know this story. It's pretty controversial and spicy, um, but there's some leftover inventory of it kicking around that I was able to come across. We all love that notion of exclusivity. We all love to know that we're drinking something that nobody else can get their hands on. It just makes us feel special. This is not available anywhere. It's sold out. It is Skin Contact Pinot Gris, and it's from the Okanagan, and it's made by my really, really dear friend, Sebastian Ott, and killed it with this skew. It's Skin Contact Pinot Gris, 
and it drinks like a baby Radicon, which I have talked about. People are always beguiled when I pour them this wine too. It's, I guess, kind of the ignorance surrounding Canadian wine, and that's from total neophytes to wine professionals. Um, there is just this lack of awareness of what is transpiring in Canadian wine. It's, it's absolutely mind-boggling to me that people don't know how much is going on. And maybe I have had the good fortune of, you know, not only living in these places, but also traveling to them. I have made that one of my priorities, and as such, I have been uh, bestowed with really, really beautiful wine. And then to sort of give some nice examples of some Eastern, we've got 16 Mile. If you've been following me for any period of time, you know that I'm all about QPR, so quality price ratio. And for whatever reason, not a lot of people know about 16 Mile, whether it's in Ontario or elsewhere. They're just this tiny little operation in Niagara. This is a rosé made from Pinot Noir. The pricing from this winery, it doesn't make any sense. So it's kind of like that whole thing of like, start the car, like go buy these wines now before they inevitably creep up in price because they will as more people find out about them. Another example that I'm super excited about, I discovered these guys from Quebec. This is Lieu Comment. Apologies if I'm not saying that correctly. And it was just a couple Psalms from Montreal who wanted to take a kick at the can in terms of winemaking. So they started buying up fruit kind of like all over the area, Eastern townships and you know elsewhere in the area. And this is actually Niagara fruit. So they're, they're vinifying it in Quebec and it's 100% Riesling barrel aged. And I was able to try a bottle of this that I took home with me over Christmas and it was absolutely delicious, super, super sexy. Again, it's really exciting to give people the opportunity to try wines like this. That's the whole goal. Like, try something new and be surprised. Um, I get a lot of people coming. They ask me to pour them just whites or just reds or I don't drink this or I only drink sweet muscat and I am not the forum for you. Go somewhere else because the whole point of what I do is to expand horizons. And of course, this is a little bit of an exception. Normally, I don't generally include international wines. I will upon request. There's so much happening in Canadian wine and something that I talk a lot about with a lot of my colleagues is that there's no way that you can know everything. It's just impossible and anybody who masquerades as such, they're just lying to you and they're probably trying to sort of shield some sort of insecurity. If you don't want to take the time or you know devote your budget to going on a trip to a wine country, which I know it can be very expensive, this is a really great opportunity to try a whole host of different styles that I guarantee you will not be able to do anywhere else. And then what we're going to start the flight with today is, again, Sebastian Ott. This is his label Sebastian Laurent, so it's a play on the variety Saint Laurent. And this is a Paquette. Why Paquette is such an anomaly. Really picked up in popularity in the past couple of years, and it was picked up in popularity by the natural community. And what's funny about that is there isn't really anything natural about Paquette. It is essentially grape must that has already been fermented to be utilized for another wine and it's rehydrated with either water or cider or honey and sugar to kickstart a secondary fermentation and then it uh, ferments to about you know four to seven percent ABV so it's just like this light spritzy like field drink that was formerly crafted to literally be served to laborers in the vines um, as like a midday refresher after having like worked in the sun for so long so it's kind of ironic and it's become really really popular I think largely due to consumer ignorance and sexy marketing. It's not serious and you should not treat it as such. It's just meant to sort of be like a palate refresher and it should not cost more than $20 a bottle. So if you see Paquette that costs more than $20 a bottle, you are getting taken for a ride. It is a really great way for wineries to find revenue. I know winemakers who have told me that by using the leftover must and essentially creating revenue, they've been able to purchase resources and barrels and concrete eggs for their winery. And that's great, I think that that's smart. It's just good business acumen, but it's like beer. Ha, ha, ha.